Okay. Good. Uh, good morning. Our goal today is to finish section 2.2, that's the finding limit stuff, and then we'll study limits sort of in earnest in our next section. I'm, let me uh, sort of put a, uh, not a rule, a general truth on the floor. It's maybe a little unfortunate, but it's a true statement that limits are easy to find, except for the limits we care about. And this is one reason I said I didn't want to spend a huge amount of time messing around with these this material. It's kind of very, very theoretical, let's say, because we're going to learn all of these rules and then we're basically never going to be able to use them for anything. So it can be a little discouraging, but it is part of the curriculum. So the rules we, we, learned yesterday was that the limit of a constant function is always just that constant function. And the limit of the identity function, which is a fancy way of saying the limit of x, is just whatever X is approaching. And then we got that the limit as X approaches C of a sum, so of one function plus another function, is the sum of the limits. And you do, I wrote this in a slightly different fashion yesterday. I had capital F and capital G, but this is what I was saying. And the only kind of restriction we have is that these limits both must exist. There are situations where the limit of a sum exists, but you can't use that rule because the individual component limits do not. And now we'll um, trundle right on the limit as X approaches C of K, a constant K times a function is undo that is k times the limit. You can pull constants out of limits would be the kind of fancy way of phrasing that. And <coughs> what do I mean by that statement? Let's clarify with an example. The limit as X approaches two of seven times X. 
So we've got this constant seven and we've got this function x. And what this rule is saying is that you can pull constants out of limits. So the limit of seven times x is a seven times the limit. And then the limit as x approaches two of x was rule number two from yesterday. That limit is, well, that means explicitly right. This is two times seven. This uh this is two. I don't know why I switched the orders. So this is seven times two. And that's where that 14 came from. Finding the limit of a sum is easy. Oh, I, it's a faux pas to say stuff is easy because maybe it's not when you're seeing it for the first time, but finding the limits of a sum is straightforward. Let's say you have a rule, you use it. Finding the limit of a product, I'm doing these in a slightly different order from the book, by the way, but finding the limit of a product of f of x times g of x is a matter of finding the individual limits and multiplying them together. So just like you deal with a sum by finding the individual limits and adding them together, so you deal with a product by finding the individual limits and multiplying them together. And again, to use this rule, the component limits must exist. And any example we give of this rule, let me see, well, We haven't written a rule for powers yet. We haven't written a rule for taking the limit of x squared. But we could use this rule to find that limit if we bear in mind that x squared is just x times x. And what this rule then says, if you've got the limit of this product, you just take the limit of the first term and you take the limit of the second term and you multiply those limits together. Let's clarify this a little. This is the second time, the third time actually, maybe that I've said, we have this rule, but to use it, the individual limits must exist. Can I give an example 
where the limit of the product exists, but this rule breaks. And it's a pretty trivial example, <clears throat> but I can. I can look at the limit as x approaches zero of x times one divided by x. And if we think about this a little, as long as x is not zero, x times one divided by x is just one. The x's cancel. And what do you know? For this to be true, x can't be zero, and zero is the only number we definitely don't want x to be. Because remember, when you're taking a limit, you're asking what happens as x gets close to zero, but doesn't equal zero. So x is not to zero. This fraction is just one. And we find the limit. It's all sort of um, banal. But notice that if you tried to use this product rule, things would kind of break. And the reason that things would break is that you get that far, and then you wouldn't be able to take one of the limits. The second limit, the limit as x approaches zero of one divided by x does not exist. Why is that? It's not because of the division by zero error. We don't care if we have division by zero errors. The limit might still exist. But let's see, did I? I did not, was not clever and did not get the most loaded up before class. Let me do so now, and let me also share this screen so that any online students can see this. Do share, here we go. Drop one divided by X, that will be F of X and we can construct, that's not what I was trying to do, we can construct a table x versus f of x, and as x approaches zero, we see that f of x is not approaching a finite number. It's exploding to infinity. And that was one of the two main reasons we gave that a limit wouldn't exist. So where are we? Back to the whiteboard. So we can't use the product rule to take the limit of this product, but the limit does exist. Nevertheless, the limit is one. Hmm. 
That's just, I know, sorry, I know I'm moving a little fast. Is everybody feeling confident about this material? Does anybody have any questions I can help you with? I mean, I know I say that and you think you don't and then the quizzes come and maybe you have questions after all. As always, feel free to contact me if you discover that maybe you do have questions at any point. But for now, I'll take that silence as, as an honest assessment and I'll keep going. So where are we? Rule six. The limit as X approaches C of a function raised to a power is at this point, you might kind of be able to guess the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. The limit of a power is the power of the limit. Um, and here, I guess we should put a caveat. If the limit exists and the power is defined. So most of the time, this rule is just going to be straightforward. And let me take a moment to remind everyone, by the way, in case you've forgotten, that the case root, come on, come, come on, that the case root, Ah, this is, I'm going to have to write somewhere else. It is not letting me write up there. So for the third time, the case root is a power. It's the one over K power. So this rule also allows us to take the limits of roots. And as I say, most of the time, I mean the limit as X approaches two of X to the fifth. We take this limit to the fifth, we find this limit. Once again, the, the number of limits we know how to find is pretty uh, narrow at this point, but the limit as X approaches two of X is something we do know how to deal with. And uh, two, four, eight, sixteen. We found the limit. And as I say, um, this is true for um, this is true for roots because roots are just a special kind of power. So the limit as X approaches four of the square root of X is the square root of the limit as 
which is two. So, boom. Let's let's comment on this a little. Um, if the limit exists and the power is defined, that's a new one. The if the limit exists is nothing special. We saw that with multiplication and addition and subtraction. But what's all of this about the power being defined? Well, what if you look at the limit as X approaches zero? of x to the negative first. The fact that we have a negative power isn't inherently a problem there. I didn't put any rules here that k has to be positive or anything like that. What is a problem? If we try to use this rule, is that zero to the negative first is not defined. We may remember, if not, it's good to be reminded that x to a negative power is one divided by x to the positive power. So zero to the negative first is a division by zero error. It's one divided by zero. This limit, in fact, doesn't exist. Rewriting x to the negative first as one divided by x. This is the example we were just looking at on Desmos. So you can use this rule, but if it's giving you a division by zero error or something like that, then obviously, I, Need to break myself of that, then you can't use the rule. And not being able to use this rule doesn't necessarily mean the limit doesn't exist. Going back here, not being able to use the product rule doesn't mean the product, the limit doesn't exist, but it might or it means you have to try something else. Okay, now that I've got kind of all of that out of the way, let's state something a little friendlier. I mean, friendlier in the sense that as a student, I know getting this, these lists of rules and then you have to learn all of them can be kind of overwhelming. This is a nice theorem that comes as a result of all of those rules we kind of torturously put on the board. If E of X is a polynomial then the limit as X approaches C of P of X equals of C. To find the limit of a polynomial, you just take C and you plug it right in. 
So for example, the limit as X approaches three of X squared minus X plus one is three squared minus three plus one, which let me see, nine, six, seven. So what's with this theorem? I have spent something like two class periods telling you that when you're taking a limit, you're letting X approach C, but not equal C. And now I'm telling you that you can take this limit of a polynomial just by letting X equal C. So, what's going on here? Well, this is all of the rules we've just been looking at at work in combination with each other. Let's take a look at this limit more closely. The limit as x approaches three of x squared minus x plus one. We've got addition and subtraction. So our addition and subtraction rule says that we can take all of these limits individually. Let's ignore this for a moment and ignore this for a moment. This is a power and our power rule says that to take the limit of a power, to take the limit of a square in this case, we can just find the limit and square it. And now we're in a situation to use the second limit rule we ever learned. The limit as X approaches three of X is three. The limit as X approaches three of X is three. The limit as X approaches three of one is one. And you see that when we used those rules, we did wind up getting, this is F of three. We stick three in here, three squared. We stick three in here, minus three. This is what we got just by using that theorem. And just like I promised, we wouldn't be spending most of to this messing around with those f of x plus h expressions. I promise we're not going to spend the rest of to this sort of torturously taking these tedious limits using the rules that we're presenting here. Okay, here's, here's a rule that I saved for last because I have the most to say about it. The limit of a quotient. We've done addition, subtraction, multiplication. There's one thing that's clearly missing, which is what happens if you have the limit as X approaches C of F of X.
divided by a g of x. This is, let's go ahead, since I've created a numbered list, this would be rule seven on that list. Well, it's about what you'd expect or what you might expect based on what we've done before. The limit of a sum was the sum of a limit. The limit of a difference was the difference of the limit. The limit of a product was the product of the limit. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limit. So why save that for last? Well, it's because this rule has a very important caveat that the other rules don't have. To use this rule, we need this denominator to not be giving us a division by zero error. So, you know, if you go back to the product rule for comparison, we say that the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And we do have this minor condition that the individual limits must exist. Well, we still have that condition. If we're going to use this rule, the, the individual limits must exist. But we also have this, and there wasn't anything like this for the product rule. <laughs> and this exception is why I said, sort of joking, but not really joking, that we can easily find limits we don't care about, but have to struggle with the limits that actually matter because we've seen in this class, and we're going to see in this class again, limits like this. The limit as H approaches zero of F of X zero plus H minus F of X zero, all divided by H. This is a limit. It's the main limit we're going to use in calc to this one. It's the limit of a quotient. And we can never use the quotient rule. If we try to use the quotient rule, we get a division by zero error. If we try to use this quotient rule, because H is approaching zero, the limit of the denominator is zero. So it's a sort of frustrating, sort of unfortunate situation. We have all of these rules that look like they should be making our life easy. But when push comes to shove, we usually can't use them. And the textbook offers up a few tricks for taking the limits of quotients when we cannot use this rule. And I want, as I say, to heavily de-emphasize that kind of limit trick 
that you learn in section 2.2 and then never use again. I'm going to limit myself, pardon, to a single trick here. Let's see how you find the limit as X approaches C of a rational function. Where we cannot use the quotient rule because it gives. Come on, there we go. Because it gives a division by zero error. What a mouthful that is to write. Let's, uh, let's look at an example. The limit as X approaches two of X squared minus five X plus six divided by X squared plus X minus six. Okay, so let's try to approach this problem naively. Let's just try to use these rules. And this should always be your first step, by the way. Your first step should always be try to do the problem in a simple manner and hope that it works out. It's only when something breaks that we start worrying about tricks. The limit of a quotient is the quotient of a limit. And we can find the limits of polynomials real quick. I, I didn't, maybe I should have explicitly reminded everyone, I know maybe algebra was a while ago, a rational function is a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So we've got the limits of polynomials, our rule from a few frames ago says that we're just going to take those limits by sticking two into the polynomials. Alas, when we do that, we get the division by zero error. And just so we're definitely all on the same page here, zero by zero is not one, it's just undefined. It's a division by zero error, just as if you had any other number up here. So our quotient rule has let us down. What can we do in its place? The trick for dealing with these limits of rational functions is to factor and then can. 
And so, and I think this is the only factoring we're going to do in this class. So if you're sitting there thinking that you hate factoring, it's not something we're going to keep coming back to. But let's see what happens if we factor the numerator and denominator. And then let's return to that enigmatic statement about canceling. Canceling what? Limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 5x plus 6. The one thing that would make this technology perfect for me, and maybe there is a way I just don't know about, would be if there were a quick way to copy things from one frame to another. We're looking at this limit, I think. Isn't the top one supposed to be plus six? Yeah, minus five plus six. Minus five plus six. So factoring each of these in a term. I may probably Mr. Detson Saloon. He teaches our 102 kids. He'd probably yell at me because there's only one factoring trick I ever learned, which was multiply these together. We get six. Then look for numbers M and N that add to the middle term and multiply to be six. And I don't even know what this trick is called, if this is factoring by grouping or what. But um, let's see, how does this factor, does it factor? I hope I didn't give us an example that doesn't factor. But I might have. No, I definitely didn't. This definitely factors. It's X. Never, never mind the limit for a moment. It's, it has to be X X minus two X minus three. There we go. Negative two plus negative three is negative five. Negative two times negative three is positive six. X squared plus X minus six. One times negative six is negative six. And the middle term of that denominator is one. So positive three and negative two. Positive three times negative two is negative six. 
positive three plus negative two is positive one. So as I say, you know, clearly I'm no, I am able to teach this course and I'm no great hand at factoring. If this is just looking completely alien to you, you might review it a little. We will be using it in one or two of the homework assignments. But other than that, this isn't like a trick we're going to keep coming back. Two. So what happens when we factor top and bottom? We get x minus two times x minus three in the top, x minus two, times x plus three in the bottom. And now the statement I made earlier about factoring then canceling is now sort of becoming clear that x minus two term appears in the top and the bottom and it cancels. And now that we have canceled this, If we once again try to use our quotient rule, we no longer get a division by zero error. We just get some number. Two minus three is negative one. Two plus three is five. So there we have the only limit trick that I think we're going to do this semester. And you'll have to bear with me. I no, I normally don't use go until 9.15, but I, with this three-day weekend and all, really do want to finish section 2.2. So let's plan to just keep trucking on. What happens if the rule we had just learned doesn't work. So what if we have the limit as X approaches two of X squared plus X minus six. In the bottom, but maybe in the top, we have X squared plus X plus one. Well, once again, we get the division by zero error if we just use our rule naively. If we try to use the quotient rule, we get zero in the denominator. And in the top, 
we get seven. And if we try to use our rule, what we're going to find is that it just fails completely. The top of this fraction doesn't cancel, doesn't factor. And because it doesn't factor, we can't perform our cancellation trick. Well, the answer to this question is that the limit, and here's some notation that appears so often, I don't think I've introduced it until now, the limit D and E, which is simply what happens when mathematicians get tired of writing, the phrase does not exist. So if the rule doesn't work, there isn't a second rule to try, there isn't anything else. The failure of this rule means that the limit of this rational function does not exist. I'm going to, uh, uh, let's see. I probably would rather just get the lesson over than pause and have you do examples and stuff. Um, the book really introduces the limits of trig functions in a strange way. Let me let me get this just stated in a neat and complete fashion. The trig functions are like the polynomials in the sense that if you want to take the limit as x approaches c of the sign, you just stick c in. So the limit as x approaches pi of the sine of x equals the sine of pi, which is zero. And the cosine is the same. To find the limit of the cosine, you just take that C and stick it right in there. And actually, all of the trig functions are like this, but I'll put off the rest of them until section 2.5. I'm doing these now because you need them for the homework, homework quizzes, whatever you want to call it. Finding the limits of the sine and the limits of the cosine is straightforward. There's, I know this is starting to seem interminable. There's just one more piece of material I need to cover today. And this piece of material is sort of in a weird place. You, the student, may very well never use this. Like, I don't think. It's in any of your, um, maybe it is in one of your quiz questions, 
but it's it's a pretty unusual situation where you'll be using the squeeze theorem. But also, it's really famous. You can't just brush it off and have a couch to this class where you never learn this. If you transfer to another institution or something, everyone would assume that I taught this to you and that you already know it. So let's present it. The squeeze theorem says, suppose we have functions that are ordered. F of X is less than or equal to G of X is less than or equal to H of X. And suppose that the limit as X approaches C of f of x exists and equals some number k. And the limit as x approaches c of h of x exists and equals the same number, also equals K. Then what the squeeze theorem says is that if we look at this middle function, its limit as X approaches C equals K as well. And the squeeze theorem is not mysterious. I might have, by saying this isn't something students use a whole lot, I might be making it seem more difficult or more complicated than it actually is. And I think that a quick sort of graphical representation of the squeeze theorem will make it very clear what's going on here. So you have C and you have K and you have this function F of X and as X approaches C, F of X is approaching K. So it's doing something like this. And then you have this bigger function H, and it's doing the same thing. It's also approaching C, sorry, approaching K as X approaches C. And now you have this middle function, and you don't know anything about the middle function, but you do know that it's stuck between this bigger and this smaller function. And as X approaches C, it's squeezed between those functions. And it therefore has no choice but to be approaching K as well. So that's all the squeeze theorem says. It looks intimidating, but it's graphically very intuitive. And with that, you are now in a position to attempt the uh, both the 2.1 and the 2.2 quizzes. Um, you should, uh, these quizzes are going to be lengthier than the chapter one quizzes because we're no longer doing prerequisite stuff. We're looking at calculus now, which requires more practice. 
So I once again implore you not to wait until the due date to attempt these because you might find them to be a little time consuming. If you have questions, as always, just post on the forums or send me a message. I will not be seeing you for quite a few days. You presumably know that we have Monday off, so I will see all of you Tuesday. Enjoy your long weekend.